Well, the last time we were in the book of Jonah, we left Jonah fast asleep. We might say we had just witnessed the captain come down below deck and give Jonah a quick kick in the ribs to wake him up, to to get him out of his slumber. And whilst the captain is doing that below deck, above deck are the the sailors that um, frantically and in a sense dramatically all each of those men praying to their own God in desperation. In a last ditch effort to save their little ship that was already beginning to break up under the pounding of those fierce seas, they had thrown the cargo overboard to lighten the load. Those seasoned sailors had never seen such wild weather. This was a very unusual storm. And this morning we're going to pick up the story above deck among the sailors. Jonah chapter 1, we're jumping straight into the story in verse 7. And this is what the sailors said to one another above deck. Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. The lot fell on Jonah. It was time for Jonah to face the music. And so Jonah climbs up those stairs. He gets up on deck. The man who had been on the run is about to be the man overboard. But little did Jonah, little did the sailors know that God had a rescue plan in the form of a specially designed, what we might call submarine creature that would double as a prayer chamber for that man privately and later it would become an amphibian craft for landing. We know that. They didn't. There's three things I want us to think about this morning as we're going to take a bigger section of this little book. We've been moving very slowly. Now we're taking a big chunk this morning. We're going to look at three things. And the first of those things is this. Simply, Jonah on deck. As Jonah wipes the sleep from his eyes, he he gets up on deck and he faces a barrage of questions. That's verse 8. Then they said to him, please tell us, from whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? Five rapid questions. What's Jonah's reply? Verse 9, so he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry sea. Land. Now, very interestingly, Jonah avoids the question about his occupation. Because that question went right to the core of his conscience. The prophet had been running. The prophet had been sleeping. And now look at the mess that he created. Due to his disobedience and his own heart being all out of sorts, Nevertheless, Jonah's answer still struck deep fear into the sailors' hearts, as is evident in verse 10. Then, in response to what Jonah just said in answering to their question, then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? The men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now, you may remember previously back in verse 5, the sailors were afraid there. The text says they were afraid due to the raging of sea. But now the news that they have just heard from Jonah in answer to their question, see how it says it's even deeper. They are exceedingly afraid when they hear what Jonah says. It's one thing to have unfavorable weather. It's another thing to fall out of favor with God when you're in a boat. Especially when you've just been told he's the God of the sea. That's what Jonah just said. 
And so you can almost hear Jonah saying, can you sailors feel the, the sea heaving under your feet? God made that sea. Can you sense the, the looming presence of the rocky coast ahead where you may soon crash? God made that land. He made the sea and he made the dry land. Verse 11 says, Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? And here's the reason, for the sea was growing more tempestuous. I mean, how could that even be? That it would be getting worse and rougher than what they had already been experiencing. This storm, Jonah, is freakish. We've never seen such wild weather. We've never seen such massive and strong waves. Here's Jonah on deck. His sin had found him out. His attempt at running had come to an end. His conscience is smitten. His heart and heart toward others has been exposed. He knows he's disobeyed God. He knows that he's the human cause of this storm. Not the first cause, but he's the human cause. In fact, Jonah knows that he's caused this great upset in the lives of others due to his own uh, uh, disobedience to his own wrong heart that led to wrong conduct. These men are, are agitated. They're worked up. They're, they're, they're overcome with fear. What are we going to do to you to help save us? Jonah knows he's caused the upset in the hearts of those other men. What are they to do? Let me just pause there. Jonah has come to realize his conduct, his heart all churned up, all upside down, all out of sorts, we might put it, has had an impact upon others. He's a child of God. We can do that, can't we? You just stop and think about that just for a minute before we go any further. We can create our own storms due to our own prickly hearts <laughs> or, or our own out of sort in a, our own rebellion can create storms for other people, not just ourselves. We can bring grief into the life of lives of others around us simply because things are not right between us as a child of God and the Lord or us and others. Isn't that what lies behind marriage problems for Christians? Isn't that what really does lie behind or underneath so many troubles in churches? Ultimately, it's people out of sorts with the Lord. Most often trying to blame others. And many cases why they are in the process of planning to run away. See the troubles that we ourselves can cause. Jonah knows what has to happen. And so finally, he mans up. He basically says to him, your only hope is to remove the sinner from your midst. Verse 12. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. I am have sinned. I have caused this problem. I want us to think about how the sailors respond to this direction by, by Jonah, as odd as it may have seemed to them. We're used to the story, but tr just try and imagine someone says here, well, here's the answer out in this little dinghy in the middle of Morton Bay and the worst thing dinger of a storm that you could imagine. And someone says, I don't know how to fix it, just throw me in. I mean, it's, it's sort of like bizarre. 
I want us to think about the response and the irony in the sailor's response. You see, Jonah is the one that should have had compassion. In the first place on the pagan Ninevites. Jonah is the one who has lacked compassion toward the pagan sailors. The, the secret prophet has been sleeping down below deck. Jonah's heart has been shown up by the pagan so sailors by the way they respond. They respond displaying far more compassion than the Hebrew prophet. Because their response to them hearing, throw me overboard, they say, huh? No way. Throw you overboard? Uh-uh. We won't do it. We can save you, Jonah. Verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard. So instead of throwing him over, the men rode hard to return to land. Do you, do you see the irony of this scene? These heathen, these pagan men show compassion toward Jonah. Rather than throwing him over, no, no, we won't throw you over. We'll get you to the land. Okay, you're the problem. We'll just get you to the land. We're not throwing you over. They had compassion for him. He's the believer. They're the pagans. He's had a heart that has been closed, as I said before, to a city full of sinners who needed the Lord in Nineveh. And although his people had experienced the grace of God for generations, Jonah shows that his heart is closed toward another people outside the covenant of Israel. But in dramatic contrast, these pagan, coarse, hardened sailors that we would have otherwise thought they were, they do everything they can to spare the life of Jonah, even after he has caused the loss of their cargo, and he may yet even cause the loss of their life. Isn't it disgraceful? As we begin to see the lack of compassion and the hardness of heart in the believer. And can't we often find more kindness and more consideration among unbelievers than among Christians? <laughs> Believers behind the scenes, biting and devouring one another, criticizing and tearing down and gossiping. What a disgrace to the name of Christ. What a lack of compassion. Here are these sailors. They're getting blisters. I mean, they're rowing hard on this tempestuous sea. And how did they go with all their attempts? Well, they failed. Why did they fail? Well, the simple answer to why they failed is you can't fight against God. <laughs> Verse 13, nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. As hard as they rode, they could not make any progress. As hard as they tried, as clear as they thought their thinking was, they could not make any progress. And friends, this is what it's always like when any of us abandon the ways of the Lord, whether it's a prophet or whether it's the pagan. When we leave the path of God's revealed will, we place ourselves on a collision course with God. And even when we think we might have a pretty good plan developed. I mean, these, these sailors had thought about what they were going to do. They came up with a pretty nifty plan and they certainly tried to put it into practice. They tried hard. They rode hard, it says. I mean, I can see how this can so much be us, really, can't it? Our thinking might appear perfectly logical to us. <laughs> but when our hearts are not right with God and we try and pursue our own plan, sincere as we may be, we end up only rowing into a bigger storm. 
Rightly did Gamaliel say in Acts chapter 5, if this plan is of man, it'll come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest even if you be found to fight against God. And that's never a smart thing to try and do, to fight against God. Continue in the narrative, verse 14, Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, O Yahweh, we pray, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. What an incredible prayer. These sailors recognize Yahweh. These sailors recognize the sovereignty of God. These sailors are crying out for the mercy of the Lord. And as they're doing this, they're walking towards Jonah to grab Jonah, to grab hold of him. And that takes us to the second thing this morning. Jonah goes down. We've been there before, haven't we, in this story about Jonah going down. This is another one of Jonah going down that we get in the narrative. Verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. They picked him up and they threw him into the sea. Normally when you someone like leaves a ship out in the middle of the ocean and, and, and you know it's it's a dangerous situation, you, you hear the man overboard! Like, rescue plan. This is deliberate. There's, there's no sense of which we have to try and rectify this. This is deliberate. He's cast into the sea and down, 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 down he goes. As we'll see in a moment, this very action is not evidence of God's condemnation. It's not an evidence of God's wrath. No, this is the father's discipline of a wayward child. Actually, as hard as it may initially seem to be, the fact is love stands behind this action by God. You say by God? Yes. Because ultimately it wasn't the sailors that threw him into the sea. Ultimately, it was God himself who threw him into the sea. You say, really? Yes. Listen to what Jonah says when he begins to see things with a little more spiritual clarity than he has been seeing things. We jump ahead to chapter 2. Listen to his words in his prayer to God. In verse 3, he says there, For you, Lord, cast me into the deep. You did it, Lord. The, the same Hebrew word that we came across earlier in our studies, sent or threw or hurled or cast in English, that, that's the same word used here of what God did with this man overboard as with what God did with the wind in the first place back in the earlier part of chapter 1. That is, as God deliberately hurled the wind at Jonah on board that ship to create the storm, Jonah is hurled deliberately by God into the stormy sea. Think about the whole thing of where Jonah is at. That's the primary point of this book in terms of understanding what's going on in Jonah. Previously, Jonah, when he was all out of sorts, his heart was all wrong toward God and others, and his entire thinking process was affected, wasn't it? And that's an important thing for us to see. Clarity of spiritual thinking vanishes when we are in a downward spiral. I don't quite understand how that all works, but that's what happens. That's what happens in this story. Clear spiritual, clear, clear thinking, it vanishes when we are in a spiritual downward spiral. Think of this story. When God cast the wind directly at that ship and caused the storm, Jonah's thinking, as we said a couple of weeks ago, Jonah's thinking was in dream world. 
let alone what was before, what was he thinking? To think he could run away from God. I mean, he was he just was not thinking clearly. When his heart was all out of sorts, his thinking was wrong. But when his spiritual balance returned, his thinking returned to a proper clarity. And so that's why he's saying now in chapter 2, verse 3, You, Lord, cast me into the sea. This is the loving Heavenly Father. He's not being cruel. He disciplines his children in order to bring them back, as it were, in order to see there being peaceful fruits of righteousness that are growing on the tree. He teaches us, yes, through unpleasant discipline. It's never pleasant to be disciplined. But it's the loving Father who stands behind that discipline that we may be learning what it is to obey with sweetness. Now, just before we continue to pursue the story with Jonah and his descent, just quickly spare a thought for these sailors at this point. As far as they were concerned, they've just thrown him overboard. He's as good as dead. Think about the situation. The man overboard has no hope of survival in that situation. Those sailors knew that in their normal human thinking. And, and, and as far as we, we, we would understand from all that we're told, we actually have no reason to think that the sailors ever saw Jonah again. I mean, we get inside information, but we have no reason to even conclude necessarily that the, 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 Jonah, the, the sailors ever heard what happened to Jonah after that point that they saw him go down under the surface of the water and never to come up again. But it's what happened next that that must have been a situation for them, at least at this much in the story that they could recall. The, the next thing that happened must have been a story they told their grandkids. Surely. Verse 15, so they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Seasoned sailors must have found it hard to believe what they were witnessing, what they were experiencing. With Jonah out of sight, the sea became completely calm. Reminds us of something somewhere else in the Bible, doesn't it? I believe we have reason to conclude at least as much from this passage of what it tells us that the once pagan sailors become converted. Verse 16. Then I've seen all this. They've heard Jonah. They've heard a witness. They've seen the evidence. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. If Jonah could only be on deck now. Just think about that. He had run to the ends of the earth to avoid seeing pagans converted. This is incredible. He tried to get away from this very thing. And yet the results of his obedience even brought about pagans converted. And maybe not only that, but these guys are on their way to Spain. And so they're taking a message about a God who rules all things and a God who saves to the uttermost even pagans like us. This story is a story of evangelism and the sovereignty of God. It's tremendous. This story is not just a lovely story to read to kids before they go to bed. This story is rich in sound and rich doctrine. He is a sovereign God using a disobedient child of God to even further his own sovereign and saving purposes. How does he do that? That not even the sin of God's people can hinder the spread of the gospel. He does all things well. We're meant to stand back and go, wow, not Jonah, not fish. Wow, God. Oh, glory to God. That somehow he can use even sinful servants of the Lord and still save. Just as well, hey? <laughs> 
Otherwise, none of us would be saved. Well, back to Jonah. I'll quickly get back there. Where's Jonah? (laughs) Where do we leave him? He's going down, down, down. Let's follow him. He's sinking down. Take a deep breath. We're going to go down with him. Come now to chapter 2 and let's read all of verse 3 as he recounts what happened. He says, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and waves passed over me. In other words, when Jonah was thrown overboard, he didn't tread water. He didn't dog paddle for an hour. Whatever you do as an ancient Hebrew... He's not used to the seas. He went down. He went under. You've been to the beach and swum in the surf and got dumped, like I mean really dumped, and you went upside down and you went inside out and you were down there and you didn't even know which way was up. Well, here's Jonah. He's down. He's all upside down. He's he's just going down. He's under the waves. We jump down to verse 5 where he further describes it. He says, The waters surrounded me even to my soul. The deep closed around me. He's in the deep end. He's being pulled down further and further into into the depths. No doubt at this point, his lungs are shouting out for oxygen. He's beginning to feel the pressure by the water around him. Verse 5 goes on to say, Weeds were wrapped around my head. Perhaps he's passing through a big clump of seaweed and now he's even struggling to see under that water. Verse 6, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. To the bases of the mountains that are down there under the Mediterranean Sea. In other words, he's going right down to the bottom to what we would often simply call the the ocean floor. And then he uses this expression, "The, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. That's how it looks to him. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Yet as I was going down, the bars were closed behind me forever. It's like an expression. It's talking about someone in prison. The bars on the windows, the bolts and bars and the the doors closed and you're shut in there. You cannot get out. There is no escape and there's no escape for Jonah. All hope's lost. Forever, he says. You see, Jonah's human senses have one message. His sight, his touch, his hearing, no doubt his taste, they're all saying one message. No hope. This is it. He's on the brink of death. We can say that because his words at the end of verse 2 are, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried. Out of the place of the grave, out of the place where the dead people go, he says, that's where I was. No hope. And so his human senses were screaming at him. It's all over now, Jonah. I'm in an absolute hopeless situation. And there's no answer. Which brings us to the third and final thing, Jonah's deliverance. Jonah on deck, Jonah goes down. Now thirdly, Jonah's deliverance. And before Jonah knows what happens next, it seems like he's going down, 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 and almost maybe right down there at the bottom before he knows what happens next. He gets swooped up by something. Verse 17, back in chapter 1, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, what a great statement of the Bible. The Lord prepared a great fish. When we get into chapter 4, God prepares other things, special things God does. Not just normal, natural things in providence, but special things. Now some people in their attempt to try and resist, some people who are 
doubters, we might call them, of this historical account have, have cited stories in history, such as one that happened in August 1891 on a whaling ship off the Frank Falkland Islands. The ship was called Star of the East. And one of the crew, James Barclay, fell overboard. And he was believed lost. But the next day, the, the whale that that whaling ship had been pursuing, that whale finally died and, and they hauled it alongside. They secured it as they did in those days and they began to cut it up. And what did they find? But in the whale's stomach, they found their shipmate, James Barclay. He'd lost him 30 hours previously. He's alive. He's bleached white due to the gastric acids. He actually testified that he had enough oxygen to breathe in there, though it was very hot. He came out in a very traumatized state. It took him a couple of weeks to recover, but he did survive. That's the story. But could Jonah have been swallowed like that? Well, perhaps. I'm not a doubter of that. But there is doubt of the historicity of that story. But that's not really the point, friends. It, it's, it's what the Bible says here is the point. Because I think the wording here suggests that, that this here is far more than just a natural occurrence, as I implied before, because the text says the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. I actually take that as a miracle. I, I mean, it may not be. Maybe just he used a big whale or a huge shark. He, he, of course he can do that. Of course he can. But I think the language seems to suggest this is a specially created submarine creature for a rescue mission for this prophet Jonah. But whatever be the case in terms of what exactly that creature is, we should not get distracted with that because that would really be a distraction. Spare a thought for the guy inside the belly of the big fish. Just try and think about what he went through. Three days, three nights, as you think this through, this is nightmare type of stuff. It's the type of stuff you may dream about when you get too hot in bed at night. You know, it's like the person chasing you to you're about to fall over the cliff. I mean, it's just, it's not a nice place to go. Here he is inside the fish's belly. Uh, no light. No light. Not only is he way down below the ocean, he's inside this big fish. He's in complete darkness and there's Jonah swishing around in seawater and digestive acids. Stomach juices irritating his skin and his eyes. Itchy skin, no doubt growing raw after three days, covered completely in this fish's slime, internal slime. It's said that the stomach of any creature is made to tighten around its contents. It would have been really squishy inside, like a really tight spot to be. How does that make some of you feel? Like, just no room to move, walls all around you, can't see a thing, things flushing all around you, no fresh air to breathe. In fact, imagine the overpowering odour of decomposing seafood slop. Because, I mean, that's what big fish eat. There's also the constant sense of vertigo. This giant creature is going up and down, sideway to other sideway. No warning to you. You can't, no window. You can't see where you're going. Is your stomach beginning to churn? He's trapped. He can't get out. There's no way out. And so can you see, to human reason, this is still a hopeless situation. But friends, in the end, this story is not about a fish. It's about the restoration of God's servant, even when he's feeling swamped under the billows of the waves, even when all the senses are pointing to him that he's sinking into hopeless despair. 
You see, Jonah's deliverance in this story is far more than just about a big fish coming along and saving him. There is something else going on here inside Jonah, not just inside the fish. Chapter 2 is Jonah's prayer inside the fish. Verse 1, it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Sometimes we think we've got to wait for the ideal context to pray. It doesn't seem to me that this is an ideal context to pray, but on the other hand, this is an ideal context to pray. Today, we would say, as we read through this prayer, that Jonah breaks copyright big time. And the reason I say that is because when we begin to analyze the prayer of Jonah, he's actually quoting from the book of Psalms all through his prayer. He's breaking copyright. In verse 2, he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. That's straight from Psalm 120. He quotes, and maybe you've got a, a, a Bible that's got a, a, the cross-references. You can see he quotes from Psalm 88. He quotes from Psalm 31, 42, 18, 3. Not only that, the whole thing of it sounds like Psalm 130. Here's a man who knew the Scriptures well. In a time of crisis, it was the Word of God that filled his thoughts. But friends, there's something else going on here in relation to him quoting the Psalms. Because it tells us that the men who wrote the Psalms went through experiences like this as well. You see, Jonah is actually not in some unique situation that has never been experienced by any other believer. Now, obviously, the ride in the big fish is a unique one. But the sense in which the situation where you feel that that circumstance that you're in is swamping you, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm just sinking under the waves. My life and all that's before me is just drowning me. That all my human senses are screaming out at me one message that you have no hope. That feeling is not unique to Jonah. We all can experience those waves crashing on us. Every believer can go through a season where there seems to be we're going down, 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 down. Maybe it's some major disappointment for you. Perhaps it's your health failure. Perhaps a relationship falls apart. Or the future just looks so bleak and you might be tempted to say, my situation is like nobody else's. It's utterly unique. If there has ever been a man whose case seemed unique, surely it was Jonah's. And yet to Jonah's comfort, he finds even in the Psalms, others before him who had been there, not in a fish, but in a circumstance where they felt that they were sinking under the waves. And what did they do? They cried out to God in their distress and God answered them. Spare a thought for Abraham. God had promised that he would have lots of children, more than the stars. But humanly speaking, that was an impossible situation. He's a very old man. His wife is old. His wife has never been able to have children. It just seemed hopelessly uh, ever going to happen, really. And yet when Paul describes Abraham in Romans chapter 4, he says this by way of a summary. He says, who contrary to hope, in hope believe. Everything in the situation before Abraham looked contrary to hope. But in hope, he believed. He trusted in God to supply what God said he would do. 
And friends, that's actually the wonderful change. It's actually the wonderful restoration that God wrought inside Jonah. Come with me quickly back to chapter 2 and listen to him and how he's speaking now as he talks to God. I cried out to the Lord, verse 2, because of my affliction, and he answered me. Verse 4, then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. There's Jonah. Contrary to hope, but in hope, believed. In the midst of an impossible situation from a human perspective, his head... He's wrapped around with seaweed. He's at the bottom of the ocean, drowning. But he cries out to the Lord in faith. And even then, just think of that as he's going down. He's quoting from what he seems to have been saying as well. He was in the water. There's quotation marks in this prayer. Even as he's crying out in the midst of his trial, in the midst of this situation that seemed impossible to get out of, even there he has faith. He cries to the Lord, even when it appeared that there was no answer, he still cried to the Lord. God had already prepared the answer. <laughs> God provided the deliverance. Somewhere, we don't know where, but somewhere beneath the Mediterranean, just before his death, out of nowhere came this massive big mouth and swallowed him up. On the human side of human, se of, of human senses, Jonah stood no hope. But when faith entered the equation, when there was reliance on the living God who rules the waves of the sea, then deliverance arrived. Yeah, to be rescued by a big fish and survive, that's pretty spectacular. But there's a greater deliverance happening here in this passage. The deeper work of God took place, not in the realm of nature, but in the realm of grace, friends. God infused a, a, a dose of grace into Jonah's heart so he has the faith to cry out to God in the midst of this trial to cry out again. You go and look over his prayer sometime later and you will see it's flavoured with praise. If that's not an evidence of grace, then I don't know what is. Flavoured with praise inside a stinking, rotten, squashy, vertigo vehicle? Praise. God had to humble Jonah. And even in that slimy, sloshy context... There's exuberant praise when he's humbled. What a change. What a deliverance for Jonah. It's not about the fish. It's about ch changing Jonah's whole heart. Verse 9, as we come to an end. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Jonah, you see, is committed to praising and offering sacrifices to the Lord. Jonah wants to worship. That's what he's saying. But not only worshipping, as he lies in that, fish's, uh, in that fish's lunch from the day before or the week before, in that context, he renews his dedication to his God and doing the things that related to his vows, that related to his calling, I will sacrifice to you, I will pay your or my vow. I have duties to fulfill. I want to live out my responsibilities that you have given to me. I want to obey you. What a change. All that I said that I would do for you, Lord, from this day forward, as much as you will allow me to have life, I'm going to do it. I will pay what I owe. And then what that glorious statement is at the end of verse 9. What a change of heart we see here when he says, Salvation is of the Lord. 
We got a sense of what the thinking was earlier in a previous uh, study. Salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is for the Jews. Salvation is Jews. What's he saying now? Salvation is of the Lord. It's all of the Lord from beginning to end, from before the time began to the, to the time into eternity. It's of the Lord. He can save whom he wills. He can save Ninevites. He can save pagan sailors. And, and Jonah could see afresh, God has saved me. I don't even deserve to be saved as a Hebrew. And my friend, he can save you today, right now. You know what that says? You can't save yourself. Salvation is of the Lord. That's what it is. It's not of you. Salvation is of the Lord. And he promises that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You can be saved. Because salvation is of the Lord. My Christian friend, if you find yourself sinking under the waves of sorrow or some trial today, I want to encourage you to join with Jonah. Join with the men of the Psalms and cry out to the Lord, contrary to hope, in hope believe. Look to the Lord. Believe in the Lord. He can even renew your heart in the midst of the darkness and the stinking trial you feel that you are in at the moment. He did it with Jonah. And with a heart renewed even in the middle of the trial, you'll be able to have exuberant praise. Verse 10 breaks the, breaks the narrative of, of, of where we've been. It, it interrupts Jonah's prayer and the fish's belly. What's verse 10 say? In some ways it's the introduction to the next chapter. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. After three days and three nights aboard that slimy, smelly submarine, Jonah's dropped off at the seaside. He's left basking on a pleasant Mediterranean beach in fish's vomit. And maybe there's a reason for that because God needed to encourage him to get up and to leave the beach and to do what he's called to do. He's humbled now and as we've heard from his prayer he's actually now eager to serve the Lord. He's eager to serve the Lord. Are you eager to serve the Lord? Or are you so caught up in your own little world even as a Christian and all your struggles and all your trials you're, 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 you're navel gazing. That's depressing. I'd be depressed too. Actually, I do get depressed when I navel gaze. It's not a good thing to do. And when we're like that, we're not eager to serve the Lord or others. It's a reflection of our heart not being right. Here's this man humbled. He's ready to be on his feet and to do what God has commanded. Well, God willing, next Lord's Day, we'll go with Jonah into the city and see what great things God is able to do. Let's pray together, friends. Let's look to our God to bless. Oh, our God, we, we yield our hearts to you this morning. And we see, our God, to what extent sometimes you have to take we foolish and wayward people. And yet we thank you that your commitment and your love to your people is so solid and so permanent that you will never let us go. We thank you that you are a loving Father who knows what we need, even by way of discipline. We thank you that we can cry to you knowing that you are the God who can help us even when we're in the midst of a trial that is a circumstance outside of anything that we have done. We thank you that you have been our help so many times in the past. And we pray that you would be our help for all of us in the days of this week, that we would feed from this your word 
and it would help us that it would be a light to our pathway that we may walk with gladness and joy and zeal in you, Lord, to glorify you and obey you in these days. Hear our prayer. Seal this word to our heart and make us people, Lord, who are right in heart with you, thinking clearly and running in your way. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.